Hi guys, so today I'm going to be breaking down a so-called good comparative essay um, and it's going to be based on the crucible and the dressmaker simply because those are the texts that I've been focusing on the most so far. Um, so we're going to be looking at structure and analysis specifically. Now what I want to highlight is that this is a good comparative essay. It's not perfect, it's something that I sat down and wrote in an hour and a half in my notes uh, on my MacBook because I was like, okay, I've got to get this done. Like, it's not going to be perfect. There are probably going to be typos because I'm not perfect. You said so many things. Like, you're perfect, some you're of beautiful. Them. Now, I will recommend that you watch this video in 720p just because there will be uh, segments of text which might not come up very clearly if you watch it on 360p or lower. Um, but let's just go through it. So your intro, I'm not going to say this is how you structure it because I don't believe in a set structure, but these are the three simple steps that you need to cover. The first is that you need to look at the prompt and analyze it carefully. So that way your intro addresses the prompt specifically. You don't want to only half address it. You don't want to not address it at all. You don't want to address it incorrectly. The second step is to contextualize the prompt and write down how the prompt relates to the text. And we'll see an example of this on the next slide. And finally, you want to establish a basis for comparison. So you want to say, you want to give a starting point on how you're going to compare the texts. Because remember, this is all about how the texts get their ideas across or the ways in which they get their ideas across. So let's have a look at the sample intro. So my prompt was compare and contrast the ways in which the crucible and the dressmaker explore the theme of destruction. Um, okay, so um, I don't know why there's that extra word nature there. Again, I'm not perfect. Um, it was probably just something that I wrote down in that note before I had written this, just because I wrote this in a rush. I sat down for an hour and a half and said, this is roughly how much time the kids will get in a sack and just did this. Anyway, so let's start. Despite the difference in the physical and temporal backdrops against which Arthur Miller's The Crucible and Rosalie Hamm's The Dressmaker are set, the two texts depict the destruction of insular communities, thus elucidating the causes and nature of destruction. So I've said how destruction ties into the texts. That is how I'm going to contextualize the prompt. Now let's move on. The two texts differ greatly in their approach, with the Crucible utilising a more linear and Brechtian approach to its exploration of destruction, while the Dressmaker uses non-linear storytelling and omission to slowly uncover the causes underlying the destruction of Dungata. So that's the basis for my comparison. I'm giving it a starting point, right? And then I continue, because I've talked about a difference, now I want to talk about similarities. I say, nonetheless, these texts converge in the ideas presented about destruction, as well as how these errors are presented. Okay, so one typo spotted so far, that's just the word nature there where it shouldn't be, I don't know why it's there, but all in all, the intro is nothing special, but it gets the job done. Okay, so now let's have a look at the structure of our body paragraphs. Uh, I, you guys can't see me, but I put air quotes around the word structure. Um, and the reason is because I really hate the idea of a set structure, especially for a so-called good essay, right? Because truly good writing doesn't need a structure. It should make logical sense without you having to follow a formula, and it should flow naturally. But I do understand that structure helps students get started with their writing, and it gives them kind of a framework around which they can build their writing so it doesn't feel as intimidating. So you want to start your body paragraph with a comparison of the two texts. You can say they're similar in some way or different in some way. Then you proceed to analyze text A, and when you're done with your analysis of text A, you remind us of what your comparison was, and then you continue by analysing text B. You rinse and repeat if necessary, and then at the end of your paragraph, you link. That's all in one paragraph, and that's what I would call a semi-integrated approach. So, um, 
people will tell you that there are different approaches to comparative analysis, specifically the structure of it. So the first is an integrated approach. This is the hardest, but it's also like high risk, high reward, right? Um, it can get a little bit messy, but it is the most impressive of the structures. Um, this is what I usually prefer to use, but I've reined it in a little bit just so that I can give you a set structure because truly integrated writing or truly integrated comparison doesn't need a structure. This is what I would call semi-integrated, which is kind of the next one down. You're integrating the two texts together into single paragraphs so that um, you can get the analysis and the comparison across in a single paragraph and then have individual ideas for every paragraph but it's not truly integrated in that you're still following a recipe where you're going, okay, first A, then B, rinse and repeat if necessary. And the final one, which I will cover in my next video where I do a lower level response, I shouldn't call it a bad response, I should call it a lower level response, um, and that's where you use what I call a separate structure, and that's where you have maybe one paragraph for text A, one paragraph for text B, and then one paragraph for comparison. So it's definitely the easiest, it's the simplest, and I wouldn't call it bad because I have had students use it in the past because they felt more comfortable with it. Um, but it's the least impressive and it's the one that um, feels neatest if you're not um, as confident in your writing, but it severely limits the amount of analysis and comparison that you can do without it feeling messy. Okay, let's have a look at my first body paragraph. Both texts demonstrate that destruction stems from accumulation and resentment against oppressive communities and customs. Okay, so here I'm using a semi-integrated response so that you can see a real structure. It starts off with a comparison of the two. So it starts off by saying that they're similar in this regard, right? Now let's move on because I'm going to start looking at text A. So I'm starting with the crucible just because it was the first text that was um, in the, the text list out of the two. So I've switched around the prompt so that it reflects this with the crucible being the first text and the dressmaker being the second text. Um, when you choose the order of text A and text B, try to follow the order that the texts are in uh, on the exam. So if it says uh, in the crucible and the dressmaker, blah, 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 in your prompt, make sure that you put the crucible first and then the dressmaker second. Try not to mix up the order once you start writing. Okay. Miller opens the crucible with a narrator explaining the social conditions of Salem before the witch trials, highlighting that the lives of the people were devoid of vain enjoyment because their creed dictated that they focus on work and prayer. In opening in an explanation of how difficult and joyless the lives of the people were from the outset of the play, Miller affords the audience a glimpse into the figurative crucible in which their new society is to be forged. He suggests that at the root of the town's upheaval, is the discontent of the people who are forced to live under a deeply restrictive theocratic system. Before I move on, so look at what I've done. I've talked about how Arthur Miller has done this and why Arthur Miller has done this. So I said how, I said um, Arthur Miller creates this sense of accumulation of resentment by simply using the narrator at the start who explains that their lives are devoid of vain enjoyment, right? So that's how he does it. And then I talk about why he does it. He does it in order to show us a glimpse of the crucible that their new society is to be forged in. Okay, now let's move on. Indeed, Betty's mysterious loss of consciousness is a result of shock, as well as fear of being accused of witchcraft. Um, I don't know why I put witchcraft as two words. It should be one word. I think it was simply because it drew a red line under it, but there's typo number two. Um, accused of witchcraft, which has been so deeply ingrained in her psyche that it causes a visceral physical response. This can be inferred by the fact that she wakes up when the men leave the room, leaving her with Abigail and Warren, who were also in the woods with her. Thus, her upbringing in a restrictive and theocratic society culminates in what is, in large part, a key precipitant in the witch trials to come. Okay, so I talk about how, again, I talk about um, Betty's mysterious loss of consciousness as a plot point. 
Now I'm starting off with this because this is actually what I would consider a mid-level response, if not like low mid-level response, um, because it doesn't really talk about the how aspect of it. Like certainly it does cover a plot point, but this is all about how the the writers construct the texts to get ideas across. So I'm starting with this as kind of like a warm-up to show you a mid-level comparison, right? Or a mid-level analysis. Okay. While the dressmaker similarly demonstrates that built-up resentment results in destruction, it does not overtly suggest this from the beginning of the novel. Instead, Ham creates a non-linear narrative that utilizes flashbacks to slowly reveal Tilly's past, using this narrative structure to slowly build up a complete picture of the injustices that Tilly has endured. So once again, this is how, and next I'm going to talk about why. The method of omission is also used to achieve this gradual revelation of the past, with Tilly's memories being cut off before she reveals what happens to her and Stuart Pettyman at the beginning of the novel, as well as the townspeople's cryptic gossip, does Mary Gold know, betraying, a ve betraying very little of Tilly's past. So, here I've covered how, next I'm going to cover why. Thus, the reader is able to experience the gradual accumulation of Tilly's resentment. Thus, both texts demonstrate that dis, uh, that destruction is caused by gradual accumulations of grievances rather than sudden precipitation. However, they differ in that while the crucible demonstrates this overtly from the outset of the play, the dressmaker does so in a gradual manner that reflects the aforementioned accumulation. So the second half of this is a little bit higher. In fact, I would say, yeah, it's like a mid-high to high level response um, in terms of the analysis because it covers how the text was constructed. It says it was non-linear and it utilized flashbacks as well as the um, the method of omission with the cryptic gossip. Okay, so we saw a low mid-level response and then we saw a mid-high level response um, in my comparison here. I haven't covered a low level response because I don't think that's what you should be aiming for and also I'm going to cover that in my next video when I talk about how a bad, what a bad essay looks like and how to avoid it. Okay, now moving on to the next paragraph. While the crucible and the dressmaker converge in their exploration of the causes of destruction of the communities of the texts, they differ in their in uh, interpretations of the nature of this destruction. So, once again, I'm starting with a comparison. While the crucible suggests that destruction of communities involves senseless loss, the dressmaker suggests that if a community becomes so dysfunctional that it invites destruction, then it is only right for it to be destroyed. So, further comparison. Now I have to back it up by saying how. In the crucible, this sense of senselessness, uh, sorry, this sense of senselessness, senseless loss, this sense of senseless loss, wow, that is a tongue twister, is fostered by the character introductions that the, nov uh, that the narrator inserts, which allows us to understand the characters and their personalities immediately, despite how short the play is. So I'm talking about that direct style of storytelling that uses a narrator to insert little bits throughout the, pro uh, throughout the play. Um, so that's kind of mid-level analysis. Um, Thus, Miller intends for the reader to view their deaths and the destruction of their families with sympathy. The senselessness, it should say the senselessness, of their deaths is heightened by the ironic fact that the characters who unwaveringly follow the ethical codes of their community, like Rebecca Nurse, of whom general opinion was so high, were condemned to death because they would not falsely confess to a crime that they did not, uh, that they did not commit. Okay, so we saw typo number three. This irony in Rebecca Nurse's condemnation is highlighted through her last name, Nurse. It associates her and Frances Nurse with a profession that demands sympathy, tenderness, and diligence, an association supported when she's introduced with gentleness exuding from her. So that's a higher level, mid-high level um, analysis, talking about why the authors chose those names. In contrast, the dressmaker creates a scenario wherein the destruction of Dungata and the punishments given to some of the people, to its people, are just. 
to some of its people are just. This sense of justice is in part supported by the poetic justice that befalls the characters who are particularly egregious in their wrongdoing. For example, Beulah Harradine, who liked to spy on the residents of Dungata, lost her sight after an accident while she was spying on Tilly. Okay, so there's my um, how. So you'll notice in this paragraph that it becomes more integrated and less structured, and that's because I wanted to show you that it is possible, right? So I'm going to talk about how, but in the other text. So let's continue. Of course, ironic punishment also exists in the Crucible, with Paris slowly, uh, with Paris losing his closely guarded money to the enemies, who are ironically housed under his own roof. However, the main difference between the text's understanding of whether the people were deserving of punishments they received is that while the people of Salem were independent, uh, mostly innocent moral agents, who were presented with difficult moral and ethical dilemmas, as Elizabeth Proctor was when she unknowingly condemned her husband, the people of Dungata were for the most part simply an unpleasant hive mind defined by its backwardness and exclusionary mentality. Okay, so... That was really good analysis. You know, we talked about ironic punishment. We talked about, uh, we compared two texts. That's really good. Um, now what I will say is the sentence was slightly long. I would have cut it down a bit, split it up somewhere. Okay. This hive mind is seen through the people of Dungata gathering around the oval to watch the football game, creating an illusion of a single large eye that looks up at Molly's house as if scrutinizing the Dunnage women. Yeah, so... It's, uh, this, this last piece of analysis was also good. It talks about the symbol of the, uh, of the eye with the oval. Now notice that there's no link here, and that's because there's something I want to show you. The two texts also differ in that while the crucible suggests that destruction is a natural and inevitable process within the evolution of society, the dressmaker sees it as a response to unnecessarily cruel treatment. Okay, so... Notice that I didn't have a link, and yet there's still a natural flow to the pieces. And that's because I've linked them at the start of the next paragraph instead of at the end of the last one. So instead of linking it there, I've linked the two paragraphs together by saying there are two differences that I'm talking about, and they're kind of similar. Okay. Now moving on, I've started with a comparison of the two. Now let's talk about how the, the authors create this difference. Okay. In The Crucible, the witch hunts are seen as a quote-unquote long overdue opportunity to recreate society itself through public declaration of personal transgression. Implicit in this idea of witch hunts being overdue is the premise that it was bound to happen. This is reflected in the title of the play itself, which reflects that the town of Salem was a crucible wherein the heat would eventually come to separate and purify its contents, and it is never a question of whether said changes will happen, but rather when they will happen. In fact, Miller utilizes a time skip in the final part of the play, Whispers Down the Corridor, to show that society progressed as a result of the witch hunts. So, I've said how, and that's through a time skip, it's through this idea of the witch hunts being overdue, and it's through the fact that um, he implies that it's inevitable through this idea of it being overdue. So there are two things that I've said there. The part about it being overdue is kind of like a mid-level analysis, I would say, and the part about the title is probably a higher level analysis. Okay, um, now let's move on. Meanwhile, the happenings of the dressmaker suggest that the final destruction of Dungata was not inevitable. Tilly initially attempts to assimilate, but as the townspeople gradually wear away at her patience, her intentions change, reflecting a uh, accumulation of her resentment. Um, oh, reflecting on a smaller level the accumulation of her resentment. Okay, so that's tying back to the first paragraph. Um, if I were to go back, I probably wouldn't say a smaller level. I would just say a, the accumulation of her resentment. So you could call that typer number four, I think. Um... In the novel, fire symbolizes a purging of fear and release of trauma. Thus, the people of Dungata setting fire to piles of trash around the Dunnage home is both a literal and symbolic exacerbation of their relationship with Tilly, which ultimately emboldens her to take action against the people of Dungata. Thus, the texts differ in that while destruction is inevitable in the Crucible, it, it was not the case in the Dressmaker. So, I've talked about 
how um, they've used, uh, sorry, how Rosalie Han has used this idea of fire as a symbol of purging and renewal. Um, and that's probably, yeah, I would say a higher level analysis. Uh, Mid-high, yeah. Okay, moving on to the last one. Um, implicit in the idea of destruction as an agent of change. So again, I haven't used a link in the last paragraph. I've used it here. Oh, okay. It turns out that I have linked both of in both of the paragraphs. So here, you'll find that I've linked in both of the paragraphs, and I like that. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, I could have just done with one, but I had enough time to do both, so why not? Uh, it's kind of like a little salt base sprinkle. Uh, on top where you're like being like, oh, look at me. I did this. Okay, so um, Despite the comparatively grave and serious approach taken by Miller in the crucible He conveys this optimistic message in the play. This is shown through the light of the quote-unquote new sun dawning over Salem Given that light symbolizes goodness It can be said that Miller intends for this to suggest that the sacrifice of the people who are condemned would form the foundation for a better society Moreover the rat it should say rattling of drums we've spotted typo number five, the rattling of drums as the play ends creates a, ten a sense, it should say sense, uh, that's number six, a sense of unresolved tension. Indeed, we do not see any of Salem's problems truly resolved in the play itself. They resolved in the time between John Proctor's hanging and the results of, uh, and the events of Echoes Down the Corridor. Thus, we are reacquainted with Salem after the events of uh, after their society has evolved, with the implication being that there was a causal relationship between the witch trials and society's evolution. So I've talked about narrative structure uh, in terms of um, resolution, or rather a lack thereof. So that's kind of a high-level analysis. The final line of the play, Theocracy in Massachusetts was broken, gives acknowledgement the loss of life was ostensibly tragic and senseless, but it facilitated a positive outcome in the long term. So, um, this is, I would say, a higher level analysis too. Talking about the ordering of lines and where they belong really ties into the construction of the texts. In The Dressmaker, the purging of Tilly's trauma was symbolised in the burning of the town of Dungata. This certainly creates a sense of satisfaction in the beginning of the... Uh, in the ending of the novel, in that where Tilly arrived in the town as a traumatised adult hiding under the cover of night, she ultimately left having faced her trauma under the light of day. However, it is, it is worth noting that while the burning of Dungatar symbolically creates a new start in Tilly's psyche as well as a blank slate for the people of Dungatar to build upon, it seems that their loss did not truly teach them anything. The mercurial way that they groaned and rocked, brawled and howled, bald and held, and suddenly composed themselves when they realised they could stay on the Beaumont property, suggests that they wept not for their wrongdoing and out of remorse upon seeing their punishment, but rather from fear of absolute and immediate destitution and homelessness. So, here I've talked about how I said um, through, the, through the mercurial shift, um, so that's kind of like a, I would say a mid-high level analysis, because it's talking about the pacing of the of the narrative, uh, or rather the pacing of what, where, and what is written. Um, let's continue. And I've also talked about why it's done. It's to show us that they're not genuinely sorry, or they're not really expressing true remorse for what they've done. It's simply that they're sorry that they got hurt or lost something. Thus, while Tilly changed as a person, the community of Dungatar itself did not change. The two texts differ in this manner. Where the crucible suggests that destruction leads to evolution, the dressmaker suggests that it merely creates the conditions for evolution, but the people of the destroyed community need to be ready to change as individuals in order to change their community. So that's the end of the body paragraphs, right? Now let's talk about the conclusion. Ultimately, both the crucible and the dressmaker explore the causes and nature of destruction. As such, the two converge in some senses where their exploration of destruction is concerned. But 
differ at times in how they convey their messages, as well as in their ideas regarding destruction. So you might notice that my conclusion is very short, and that's because it doesn't need to be long. I timed myself for this, I said 90 minutes, and at the end I was like, oh, like, there is not enough time for me to proofread, I want to get this video done as soon as possible, so I'm just going to finish it as quickly as possible. If you've written a good essay, your conclusion should just be a formality to say, guess what guys, I finished this, suck it, right? Um, so don't worry too much about your conclusions. So you might now be wondering, uh, what would I give this essay? Well, I think I've been a bit harsh on this essay for certain things I've said that they're like, mid-high level analyses when they're kind of like high level analyses um but that's also because i wrote it myself right if a student gave me this i'd be very happy with them um i would probably give this maybe a nine nine and a half possibly like an eight and a half somewhere in that range eight and a half to nine and a half uh, out of ten so if you guys weren't aware in your exam each of your essays is marked out of ten um basically anything above an eight is quite good so um, don't get your nicks in a knot about that. So I hope you guys learned something, and I'll see you guys in the next video.